Imagine spending five hours in New York City, Time Magazine, with Philip Harara. That's a long time. And we weren't talking about the birds and the bees. He wanted to know what was going on with my life, where I came from. He wanted to understand this Highway Beautification Act from start to finish. He wanted to know. Now keep in mind, he was not ignorant of the subject. Don't worry, Time had their contacts in Washington, D.C. Their uh, bureau chiefs were in Washington, D.C. They were getting inside information, little bits and pieces here and there. But I had become a story, a story that Time Magazine owned, Fortune Magazine, and they wrote this great article on me that completely opened up the world to me and gave me credibility. Life Magazine, which I'm not even referenced, had written an article on me and came out here, spent a week with me, and furthermore, they sent the photographers. So all the pictures that were used, all were shot with uh, Life Magazine. A guy by the name of Roger, and he was an amazing guy. Now, Philip Parara, I like this guy. He was a very warm personality. Imagine spending two hours in a special restaurant on Third Avenue that served clams. And we ate clams till we were stuffed with clams. And I loved every minute of it because I'm insanely in love with clams. But he had the main question was this. Doug? What do you really want in your quest in Washington, D.C.? That was the question. And I was honest. I said, money. And he knew that anybody else you'd ask that question, they wouldn't answer it with money. Money. And the reason I want money is because the founding fathers in the Constitution had written in there that the government cannot take property of any kind for the use of the public good without paying just compensation. It's that simple. And what was happening was the government was stalling. The original bill called for three, and this, was, of course, was an authorization bill, which most of them end up in the file forever. But this was an authorization bill, $300 million to start the funding of highway beautification to pay the sign owners. They were stalling. And one other reason they were stalling is because the previous Secretary of Transportation, Alan S. Boyd, had gone before Congress asked, when he was asked the question, how are you going to pay for this uh, highway beautification program? How are you going to pay the sign owners? Simple. He said, we're going to pay them by letting them own their signs it's a long enough that the normal depreciation ends up paying for it. Well, Mr. Boyd, how long is that? And he said, three years. That's theft. As I am sitting here at 81 years of age, I have a billboard downtown Idaho Falls, Idaho, right now. That was built on the highway system that the government helped to, to uh, pay uh, for, to implement it. And that billboard has been there since I was 23 years of age 
and I'm 81 now. Now, I'm not a mathematician, but I can tell you it's over a half a century. And it's paid me money every single month. And so it's been there for longer than 50 years. So he comes along and says three years. Any money that the federal government invested on any road, remember that's 220,000 miles of the uh, federal road system, but the interstate system, which up to this point when we were talking, they had already built 30,000 miles. Today it's around 44 up to 50,000 miles. They keep adding to that interstate system. Now, so I said, if I don't stand up and demand that they pay for my sign, they, that's set a precedent. They can take a house and not pay for it. They can take a pig pen and not pay for it. Who knows what they can take? But I'm the only one standing up right now demanding that they pay just compensation. And we want to know now, as sign owners, what they're going to pay. Now, I have a contract, and that contract's with the state of Utah. And it stipulates unequivocally exactly what they have agreed to pay me, not only individually with the paperwork, but also collectively for all the signs in the state of Utah. Okay, now, uh, he talked about another couple things. One was this. Tell me about the uh, Highway Trust Fund. What do you know about that, Mr. Snar? I said, well, really, I don't know a lot about that. Because I've always been under the understanding that the payment for my program is to be paid for from the general fund. The general fund is the normal taxes that businesses and individuals pay. It, be, it would come out of that to pay to take for my contract and other contracts that could be entered into. But I admit that the trust fund would be far superior. That's what I would really like. But I've been told that the House Subcommittee on Roads, as well as the main uh, uh, committee on, uh, on uh, uh, public works, would not ever consider ever breaking into that trust fund. So I never have even spent any time thinking about it. Well, you just drop that with me, that little thought. Well, he did leave me with this. You've come a long ways, but really your fight has just begun. Now, I was curious, what is he going to write? Now this, I got this little article here, which is the second time Time Magazine has written on me. And when just barely read a little bit, but the heading of this article is cracking the highway trust so he knew more than I did. And he knew more what was going on pursuant to the trust fund and the position of the administration, which would be Secretary Jean A. Volpe and the White House, which means President Nixon on this one. This is so big, he'd have to be involved all the way on that. So I was very curious. Now he mentions this about the cracking the highway trust fund. Now, if that's possible, so he said, so here he wrote, John A. Volpe must enjoy confounding his critics. Now, of all the people I've talked to back there, 
the one that can do the most to further my cause without question would be John A. Volpe. But most of them have so many things going on. These secretaries of treasury and whatever it is, they don't have time to spend a lot of time on just one issue, particularly if it's just a small issue. But my approach to Volpe was, when I presented my case to him, Mr. Volpe, most people during their period of being on the president's cabinet, what they put in motion, they never see realized. It happens after they're gone it being realized. This one issue, you could see it realized in your term as Secretary of Treasury. And it's a big issue in the context of the whole environmental movement. Well, then it says this in this article, a little ways down. This week, when Volpe presents the Highway Act of 1970 to the House Public Works Committee, he plans to go farther. Now, farther than what? Farther than just uh, a pilot project to remove billboards company by company rather than sign by sign, which was my whole concept. He proposes to open the hitherto untouchable, indeed almost sacrosanct, Federal Highway Trust Fund. The key word, sacrosanct, what does that mean? That means it is most holy. It means it is inviolable. It means that it can't be cracked in the context of this. It's above that. So if any money is gonna be used, it has to be used to take these signs down out of the general fund. That's what this says, because that's how a most holy that highway trust fund was. When President Eisenhower decided to build a interstate system across this nation he realized in that Second World War that because of the road system of America and the roads so narrow, they could not move things from one side of the country to the other fast enough. It was way too inferior. They needed to get this highway trust fund going in order to get the money to be able to build an interstate system. He was aware that the Germans had built an autobahn. And it was big. Hitler did that, to get and move traffic fast in Germany. Well, so the Highway Trust Fund came into existence. That's four cents on every gallon of gasoline. Now, at the time I was back there, it was bulging. They had over three and a half billion. Well, how much that is in today's money, you just go at least 10 times that, just sitting in there. You're talking about, you know, a three and a half billion. You're talking about uh, 35 billion at least, 10 times. And it was to only be used for building roads only. Nothing else incidental to the highway system under any circumstance, no way. Now, the man who set that up in Congress was a man by the name of George Fallon. He was a congressman from the state of Maryland. Now, you remember that congressmen are voted in every two years. But he was the chairman of the Public Works Committee. Now, down below that, the subcommittee on roads was Kluzinski. The man with behind that smiling face is an empty head. That was what was people characterized him, went on and on about that. Okay, now, I go down further. Now Volpe 
wants to broaden the uses of the fund to include billboard removal for beautification. And boy, that house, who promised me, Kluzinski did, during lunch with Dick Sullivan, most powerful man, chief counsel for that entire committee, and Audrey Warren at a luncheon, that if I could get Mayor Daly to tell him this all right, if I could get Volpe to agree to support highway beautification, which came about by the Democrats and Volpe a Republican, if I could get the White House to budget the money into the payment of these signs, that on that basis, they would move ahead on a positive way and eventually get the bill onto the floor to vote on yay or nay. I got all three. They knew I could not do that. And to looking back, I still don't know how I pulled that off. But the presentation to Volpe in his office with all those people around me, including Audrey Warren, my enemy, and Dick Sullivan, my enemy, from the House Public Works Committee, right there, observing every word so they could report back how Volpe responded to me. The most important presentation of my life. And Volpe said, yes. It was stunning. Now it goes on. Catalyst for Volpe's startling proposal was Douglas T. Snar. Last year, Snar became a one-year lobbyist. Snar's crusade had hardly begun after I accomplished all three of those things, after I had the Senate on my side, after I had the White House on my side, through Chuck Colson, after I had the Department of Transportation on my side, and I surely had the press on my side. So there that House Public Works Committee, particularly the Subcommittee on Roads, they were isolated, but they were holding and, you, and all politics is, is you got to have the votes, and it breaks down to how you divide the pie. It's all about money. Then he goes on to describe me. Idealistic, insistent, resplendent, in purple suits, and iguana cowboy boots. This winter, he astonished politicians by convincing John A. Volpe to act. Without Volpe, I was dead. I explained this earlier on uh, in the previous disc. Well, the, one of the things that also happened, and I would like to get number two, and uh, that when I first went back there, when I first went back there, there's one gentleman from the press that immediately wanted to know who I was, even before, long before the Fortune article, long before anything. His name was, uh, was um, Gordon Elliott White. Now, Gordon Elliott White represented the Desert News. He was what you call a stringer. He had about four newspapers that he represented because these papers couldn't afford to have a full-time person. So they each, these four would happen to have agreed to let Gordon Elliott White represent them. But usually the big issues he could use with all four, he just had to kind of adapt it to fit the particular market where these four came from. Gordon Elliott White couldn't believe that I'd come out of nowhere. With no experience, I mean, <laughs> there is no way. It cannot be done, it's impossible. But nevertheless, he was intrigued. So have, we had five years go by, 
and this one was written June 17, 1970, the Desert News. And what this is, is Utah Doug Snar wins. That's what it says. Doug Snar wins. He was way premature. What he believed, that once Volpe had agreed and the White House had agreed, I had him. And uh, by cracking that uh, trust fund, that was the way to go. No question about it. And one of the reasons I'd like to discuss that trust fund a little bit more. If I had tried to do it without the trust fund, every year you'd have to go before the Congress to get money appropriated to continue to pay. They'd only pay outside of the trust fund year by year. And that would mean before Congress. But you get into the trust fund, the way the trust fund is structured, you wouldn't have to ever go back. That would be up to the administration to determine how the funds are to be spent. That's how it was originally set up. Because how could they build an interstate system that if you have to keep going back every year to get money? So you have a, 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 a Barack Obama comes along and screws the works up, for example, or whoever it might be. No way. So the trust fund means that once that kicks in, it's there. And so he says here, Utah and Doug Snar wins. I'll read just a tiny bit from this article. When the Nixon administration unveiled its highway program last week, Utah and Doug Snar had won a pretty impressive one-man victory. For all the inertia, big money, interests, entrenched power, and alleged unresponsiveness of the system, Snar proved that the force of one small man can be felt in Washington. Then it goes on to say that I developed this program, and the program that I had developed was basically this. It was figured out that for every dollar that would be appropriated to remove billboards, two-thirds of that would be spent in red tape and paying uh, bureaucrats and governmental employees. The sign companies would get one-third. That's the problem with government. It eats up the money before the benefit goes out to the people in so many programs. Well, I saw through that, and I developed a method. For example, in Utah, there were, and throughout the whole state, 22 sign companies. They owned 10,000 signs. And the way it was set up by the government to implement the program, they'd take a little section of road, then we would take and praise each one of those signs on this little section of road, depending upon how much money we had, would determine the size of the section of the road. And uh, then they would take and go through probably upwards to 50 pieces of paper by the time you're thro through with each sign. 50. And I had figured that out by working with the, with the department, Utah Department of Highways. I had the information, how that would be implemented. So I said, forget about that. All you do is have one negotiation with each sign owner. So that would be 22 negotiations against 10,000 signs in Utah. And the 10,000 signs in Utah, it would take years to do it. In the meantime, the companies are destroyed, they're strangled, they can't use the money to, to, to any advantage because it just dribbles in. Give them the money in one big shot and have the companies take their own signs down. The government can't take them down, right? They'd have to get a warrant to get in there on the property anyway. Well, sign owners have a lease. They can get in there on their own. 
So they just save money there, just all the way down the line. They take five people, two trucks, where the sign company can do two people with one truck. And so everything is more efficient, more sensible. Well, that was my position. Okay. It says, uh, Snar moved in on this capital, fighting an apparently uh, futile fight. So when I started, my effort was futile. And one of the reasons was because I had more of an enemy than just the uh, House Public Works Committee, period. Who was that second enemy? It was the biggest sign company in America, owned by Minnesota Mining and Manufacturing, 3M. They had 60,000 signs in every state in the union. And they just took the money they needed and donated to every one of those campaigns in that House uh, Subcommittee on Roads, and they were all bought off. But it also paid for uh, a belief to support what they originally said we want to maintain the uh, fidelity of this program for road si for, for highways only. So there is another side to the story. Most important of all, the money could come from the huge highway trust fund, which does not require congressional appropriation. So once they agree to crack, you never have to go back to Congress ever again. The administration then can just take and put the money out there in these states, which is allocation, I've explained that to you, authorization, appropriation, allocation, and appreciation. There's four A's that are involved in the process of getting a sign down. And uh, so anyway, that's been already explained to you. And I'm, I'm kind of nice to have this little article. I have 81 years of age looking back. And I was, when I went back there, I was still in my 20s. I was in my late 20s. So I a little tiny kid, basically, <laughs> compared to all these other guys. Through it all, Snar has been the force that has kept the effort going. In a capital that has lately been labeled unresponsive. Doug Snar's example shows that patience, work, and persistence by just one man can still get through to the United States government. So I, I just had to reference that article I believe I learn more from Gordon Elliott White giving me a kind of a big picture, as particularly special early on than anybody else. Because I always ask him the question, what would you do if you were me? That was the most, <laughs> gosh, used question that I asked during all those years because it put them in my shoes and it pricked their conscience. What would you do if you were me? So then he'd kind of give me an idea where to kind of go next. I mean, he really did help me a lot. And he helped me before I met Kay Danes. And Kay Danes, it was a combination of working with both. But from then on, it was mainly Kay Danes, more so. What I want to achieve today is verification. That's why I'm referencing these articles. It's verification that, uh, that what I say can be supported, every word, with an article evidence that uh, I am telling the absolute truth in this interview and that I'm making these interviews for my family, and uh, hopefully, uh, maybe 100 years from now, I don't know, 
uh, they'll know that there was a guy named Doug Snar in their family line. The Department of Transportation, you gotta see it, that you got on top, that John A. Volpe, the secretary, and they have to oversee everything in that department. Airports, everything that's, do, that's being done in transportation across the United States. It's huge. And, but they spend more money than any other department with the exception of defense. Uh, was right there. And that committee on public works, again, only one committee is above them in the amount of money they handle, and that is defense in those days. Now that's changed, it's health is second. Kind of a tragedy, and I think. I, there was an article that came out in the Washington Daily News, and I kinda, I kinda like this, and uh, about my situation in July 17, 1970. This is uh, written by William Stife. This is a Scripps Howard uh, staff writer for the Washington Daily News, and they have newspapers all over America. It said this, that Snar has spent more than 170000 to su on the support of his bill. Well, that's what it cost me, mainly for airplane trips back and forth, and my rent, and so on, and taxi cabs, and everything else. I did do don donate to any of the campaigns. None. And uh, it says he's made 37 trips to Washington since his first one in April 1967. Now, it also says Mr. Volpe became Mr. Snar's most enthusiastic backer. I couldn't have a better one. There's another name that has come into this. I've talked to you about George Washington, Jr., the general counsel for the Department of Transportation, first black man to get a degree at Harvard Law School. First one. He was wise. I loved that guy. The second one was one that I named George McInturf. And uh, I want to talk about uh, uh, one comment that George McInturf made. He was, you got two parts. You got the top, and then you got the bottom. And in the bottom is the Bureau of Public Roads under Frank Turner. I've talked to you about him. The man that Eisenhower chose to build the interstate system, to oversee it. And he had he'd been there for 42 years. He knew where all the skeletons were. He, he immense power. Well, they had set up an acting, an acting national beautification man and his name was George McInturf. He was a former FBI guy. He was an attorney. Now, something about him, I just, he gave me the willies. I don't know why, but he was always saying nice things about me to my face. I didn't trust him, just the way I felt. He said this, it's good to have an ally like Doug Snar. This was in the, uh, National Observer, Monday, August 24th, 1970. 1970 was a huge, huge important year. He's beating people over the head for us. For years we fought a losing battle with no one in our favor. The conservationists, which is the environmentalists, were against us for just compensation provisions, just taking steel as signs. That's the environmental movement. I hate them. I hate them to the core because they're not honest. Uh, the outdoor advertisers were against us because they thought we wanted to wreck their industry. Well, it was going to be wrecked, no question about it. 
Now I sit back and watch Mr. Snar fight. And to me, it's great. Says Mr. Snar, I used to be a slugger. <laughs> I've won about 100 fights. And boy, I'm, re I'm, boy, I'm ready for this one. But anyway, so there's, uh, there's Mac and Turf. Now, uh, then the next thing that happened was about the best thing of all. And that was, here I was one day, I go to go down to work, and they're sitting in front of my, on the street, 16th Street, just off Scott Circle, is my yellow Chevrolet Suburban. And in it is Carol at the wheel. And there's all four of my children. Sleeping bags, the whole works. Carol just said, I just can't stand it any longer. Now to drive around, she, she can't even hardly make it to the grocery store unless you can, because she doesn't have the confidence of being able to figure out where, how to get to places. That's not her forte. So Brooke, 12 years of age, my oldest, took a map, probably a series of maps, and he took her all the way from this house right here on 4728 Deer Creek Road in Salt Lake City and ended up in front of the apartment on 16th Street in Washington, D.C. And there she was. She never told me she was coming. He just, there she was, waiting for me because they got there early to come out of the door. And there they were, all smiles and everything else. It was absolutely, uh, transcended everything. Most important thing in many ways. But she got an idea real quick of how involved I was, but her role was the children. She was there. So Brooke's job was to figure out where they're going to go every day. They're not going to just sit in the apartment and stare. They're going to take advantage of it. We went to all the memorials, on and on they went. One of the things we just loved the most, practically, uh, that in the summer, and this was uh, during that time, uh, and they were there for, uh, all ended up being there for upwards of three years. It was great going to the Capitol in the evening and listening to the Army Band one night and then the Navy Band and then the Marine Band and then you've got the uh, Air Force Band. All different, led different, they're all dressed according to uh, whatever uh, field of endeavor they're involved in, in the uh, armed services, great uniforms, it was fantastic. Well, they ended up in this one room apartment with sleeping bags. This apartment isn't any much bigger than this right here. And it was all there. We got this little place for the refrigerator and a little sink, and uh, that was about it with a little uh, hot stove, tiny electric thing. They had uh, uh, one little bathroom for all of us, <laughs> oh brother. And uh, it, was, it was great. Carol put a little sign out there, God bless, uh, uh, see God bless our family. She put it on the door. And it was during this time that it got out in the news that we were all crammed in to this one room apartment, the whole family. And I had been working to try and get this bill through Congress for all these years. But I get a phone call from Dan Rather. Now Dan Rather was the uh, bureau chief for CBS at that time. Later on, he replaced Walter Cronkite as the number one newscaster for CBS News, which in those days was the number one uh, news program 
on television, period, by far. Well, Walter Cronkite was amazing. Dan Rather was a bulldog. So he comes up there, <laughs> brother, and uh, interviews us. Well, when he got there, I wasn't there. So it was Carol and the kids. But he had enough on me uh, from just looking up all these articles that come out on me. And I've referenced earlier that all of a sudden after the fortune and everything else, and after it got out, that Volpe was on my side and the White House was on my side. I was attacked, literally attacked, by these newscasters of all kinds from all over the country wanting an interview. And, but this was big time stuff. Now the story goes that they broadcast this show uh, in the Walter Cronkite uh, uh, news series. My mother happened to be, just happened to be, had the television on and she saw it. I have never seen it, but she saw it. And when she saw it, then it was over with. She ran to the phone, phoned the local station, and wanted to know if they could play it again. And well, they can't. <laughs> wanted to know if they had a copy of it. Well, they didn't have a copy of it. But uh, she got excited. I'm glad to see that in her. Uh, I really am. I never did really tell her much. I didn't tell my family what was really going on. Uh, it was too complex. Uh, and I didn't have the time. It just was too much. I just, I, I couldn't do it. She was too much of a, of a different generation. But it boiled down to this, that my battle was with, in the final analysis, with the House Public Works Committee, but the biggest of all was Minnesota Mining and Manufacturing. They were bitter. They were after me. They wanted me out of the picture. And in a way, I felt threatened, and I didn't feel totally secure uh, around them. Now, <clears throat> the, what happened was that the House did not support me. And this was a critical year 1970 was a critical year to get this uh, program through Congress. And so when Volpe put the program into the Federal Highway uh, program, that's why Gordon Elliott White, White said, Snar has won. And in a way, he was right. I had won. It was only a matter of time. But... The House did not go along. And the reason was they, they were all willing to go along and crack the fund except one man, George Fallon of Maryland, the original person who helped set the Highway Trust, Trust Fund up originally. And he said, no, we will never, ever, as long as I'm here, we'll never allow you to crack the Highway Trust Fund. So, I lost. But, the year still hadn't run its complete course. Fallon, every two years, like every other congressman, is in an election. He'd been there for years. And a young upstart in Maryland, out of Baltimore, challenged him. And we were in, involved in a Vietnam War, and he wanted peace, this young upstart, and he defeated Fallon. So therefore, even though they said no, there will be another year. But I know that we have to have it now. And here is the edge that we had over them all. Fallon was weakened, 
So it was understood that the person who would replace him was a man named John Blatnick. John Blatnick is from Minnesota. That's where 3M's from, Minnesota. So I had mixed feelings. Oh my gosh, I'll just go pay him off and I'll be out of business. <laughs> this thing is gonna go on forever. How can I ever win this thing? And uh, just keep going on and on and on. The catch was this that when they originally set this program up, the interstate program by Eisenhower and the trust fund, it was for a period of time and they figured that it ought to be reviewed in 15 years. So the 15 years was up and the 1970 Federal Highway uh, program and, uh, and the fund, the bill for that was was up to be reviewed. Well, you're not gonna get that reviewed without the approval of the White House. And you're not gonna get that uh, program reinstated without the White House and John A. Volpe of the Department of Transportation. So we had leverage, and what they wanted was to crack the fund to use for removal of billboards. So there had to be a compromise here. Even as stiff and as tough as that house was, if they get too tough, all they'll say is, well, we're not going to sign the bill unless you agree to the uh, removal of uh, billboards and the beautification of America. So that was the battle. Blatnick was going to replace Fallon, he's been on the committee too a long, long time, refused to take a position. So he excused himself from voting. He excused himself from even participating because eventually, it's only a matter of time, they're going to have to meet with the Senate and then work out the differences. And the Senate and the House are going to have two different bills but they got to come together in conference, it's called, the Confervies, which is all done silently. No one knows. They keep it secret. It's a secret. All the people know is what comes out of conference. And so it's, it's a very, very unique situation with the, with the Congress in that context. Well, Fallon is going to be gone. And Snar and Volpe in the White House has the edge. And the key is the imminent expiration of the interstate program. And all of a sudden, we have got lever. Give me a lever long enough and I can move the world. The ancient Greek saying. Now, in addition to that, Volpe had been calling the Chairman of the board of 3M. He had been calling the president of 3M. He wanted them to participate in this process. He was willing to listen to their ideas. And so far, he had gotten nowhere. They held out, we will not take a sign down. So a meeting was held. This was a big meeting. And in this meeting, what you had, and I'd like you to hand me the next one, William Steiff, who uh, writes for the Washington uh, uh, News, Daily News. He also writes for all their papers, one of which is the Rocky Mountain News in Denver. He tells this story that I think is amazing. Volpe. This week, set up a meeting of his chief assistants with national advertising's two lobbyists. So National 3M had two lobbyists there. I'll bet you in today's money they're paid a quarter of a million dollars every year. Easily. And these guys were real pros. Name, Chris Halverstein. 
and David Reedy, and two Western billboard owners, <laughs> Douglas T. Schnarr of Salt Lake City and Louis Gregg of Boulder, Colorado. He had joined with me. He knew I was right. He had 2,000 signs in uh, about, uh, I, I figure, about six states. Mine were in 13 states. Who want the government to fulfill, blah, 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 past that. In the room were lawyers, one for 3M and one for Schnarr and Greg. And, of course, that was William K. Danes, the J.C. Penney attorney, missionary in Great Britain when I was there. Just one of those wonderful things, but as smart as they come. He represented me. And at least, it says, and two for Bolpe. So you had Joe Bosco and they had two attorneys for Bolpe, the high level. Now down below that level, and at least three other Volpe advisors. Those are those others. So this, the purpose of the conference was to try to reach a compromise to make sure Volpe and his team knew exactly what 3M wanted. Now this is the way it happened. It was a two hour meeting, maybe a little over two hours. One big table, much bigger than that table there, huge table. There they were, two with their lawyers, three. So now we had all these guys. So there was myself and Greg, and next to me was my attorney on my left. And then uh, there was Joe Bosco representing Volpe, which is the same as having Volpe there, actually. And then he had the general counsel, general counsel's assistant, and then he had uh, the... Uh, George McIntyre from uh, the Bureau of Roads and, uh, and their attorneys. Well, here's the way it went. Bosco introduced everybody. Then he sat down and turned the time over to them. And they started to talk. And they went through all kinds of, well, we got to have scenic areas where uh, you can have uh, no signs. Well, the scenic areas were so, f they couldn't name one, but they were just talking, you know, it, just, it was just baloney. We've got to have these scenic areas. So after they get through talking, and, he'd, and uh, the 3M guys talked directly to Bosco. They ignored me completely. So all Bosco would do is when they're through talking, he'd just go like this to me, and I had to answer. So it went like this from them to Bosco, he refused to answer, turned it over to me, and I'd answer. So boiled down to the battle between two of them against, actually three of them, against myself and my attorney. My attorney would only deal with the legal issues only, which wasn't about much. They didn't hardly amount to anything. But it was great to have him there at my side, and I appreciated that. So that was the battle, back and forth, two hours. That was it. And when it was through, they did not agree to, re to remove one sign. And I knew I had won that battle with them. The Volpe had the ammunition he needed to proceed, and he could always say, I gave him every chance in the world to come to the table, maybe work out a compromise of some kind, whatever it might be, they had no ideas, not one. It didn't amount to anything. Unworkable, just verbiage. Talk, 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 but nothing to it. Now, this is discussed in number seven, and uh, if you've got it there, right here, I've got this right down here, and I like what it says here at the end of this, 
The secretary doesn't care who knows that he has come out swinging. He came out swinging. And it brings out exactly what I've described to you, how it worked. And uh, so I was starting to get very, very confident that we're going to survive this. Even though they've turned the bill down, we can still beat them because Congress is still in session. And they might have to, with, if they get into the conference, conferees with the Senate, we got all the weight on our side. And it's just everybody in the world against that little committee and their conferees in that conference that would yet to take place. So I get a phone call from Dick Sullivan. I've talked to you before about him. Six foot four, Brooklyn, beautiful white hair. He'd been there longer than Fallon even. He had been there from the beginning and prior to the beginning. He stays. Congressmen come and congressmen go. He stays. They only allowed congressmen on that committee who was dead uh, in agreement that we will not, that I will not break the trust fund or they wouldn't even be on that committee. So both Republicans and Democrats were all on the same page. Now that's not bad. I, I believe in that highway trust fund, by the way. I really do. But I think the argument that in as much as the people that benefit from the signs are those that are on the highways only has something to do with it. So, and time had been, 15 years had gone by, it was time. But I was biased, I'm prejudiced, I admit that. Now I'm in front of Dick Sullivan, which I would see on average at least once a week. I'd see, he'd be the grumpiest, growly man you'd ever meet in your life. <laughs> and to try and get a smile out of him was oh, next to impossible. But he had changed his attitude towards me. After the meeting with Volpe, and he saw what I was really like and how I presented myself to Volpe in a, about a 45 minute to an hour presentation and how I'd hit Volpe's desk so hard and let him know who I was and the power that I had in that uh, discussion with him and the logic of it and Volpe just buying into it that fast. Therefore, Sullivan, for the first time, started to take me very seriously. Now I'm in there. Here's what he said. Doug, I've grown to like you. I've grown to respect you. I admire your tenacity. But I have sat in this chair most of my adult life since becoming an attorney. I've seen so many people come here to Washington, D.C. with high hopes and all that it entails. And I've watched them just give out everything they've got and they lose. And they go back home a broken man and they're never able to regain their strength and their position they had before coming to Washington. This is a very, very difficult town. Nothing more difficult, perhaps in the world practically, where there is a parliament and a legislative system than right here. Now, I want to advise you something. This committee is not going to give in. We will not give in to cracking that highway trust fund. That will never happen. And therefore, you're going to lose. You can stay here for as long as you want to, but you're going to lose. And we're going to win. There's been many attempts through these years to crack that highway trust fund, all have failed. So the dream of the SNAR plan is not going to ever come into existence. 
I recommend you go home. As a friend, as a friend, someone that really likes you. Something came over me. And I was stirred to the depths of my soul. And I stood and I walked around that desk and I grabbed that man by his collar. And I held him right there in his seat. And I said, Dick Sullivan, please hear my position. I will leave this town only on two conditions. Number one, that the highway beautification program and the SNAR plan is implemented or in a pine box. One of the two. That's it. I want you to know that I will win. For three reasons, I'm morally right. You passed that Highway Beautification Act. You didn't fund it like you should have. You have delayed, delayed, delayed because you're in the pocket of national advertising. Not what's best for the country, only what's best for you and national advertising ability to pay you all off. I'm morally right. Number two, I'm legally right. Because the law is very clear what should be done, and you've not implemented one provision of that law. You've only delayed. The environmental movement is big. It's on my side. I am politically right. You're morally wrong, you're legally wrong, and you're politically wrong. And that's why I'm going to win. And I walked out of there. I was drained. I was drained. Well, then I went to Volpe. And that was great to be able to just walk into his office practically. And I said, Mr. Secretary, you need help. You need a Mr. Insider. You need a highway beautification czar that reports to only you and to Joe Bosco. It's not me, but you need one. Now let me ask you a question. How, do you know anyone from the great state of Massachusetts that understands this highway beautification program and all that's involved in this program that could step in because you've got to write the federal guidelines that uh, this law is going to pass. I feel it in my bones it's going to pass, that you're going to prevail this year before the year is out. Once the law passes, now in Congress, here's how it works. Congress passes the bill. Then they take and they have an opinion of the majority and then they have an opinion of the minority. So that then it's the, up to the duty of the executive branch, which is the department, let's say in this case, of transportation, to write the guidelines incidental to the federal mandate. And they have to figure out what is the intent of Congress. And based upon that intent of Congress, they write the guidelines. Now, they're given a period of time to write them, which is 90 days. Now, when they write those guidelines, that goes back to Congress. And the committee that originated the bill in the first place, they overlook these guidelines to make sure that the intent of Congress has been realized and that the executive branch has not overstepped its bounds because Congress has oversight responsibilities. 
And therefore, if they have any suggestions, they make those suggestions, then it goes back. And then those suggestions are implemented in the federal guidelines. So what the law becomes is the guidelines. That's the law. That's what people have to abide by, are the guidelines, because they're the expression of the intent of the original bill. That's just the way it works. I said, now, do you know of anybody in Massachusetts that can help you? He says, no. Do you know of anybody in the Department of Transportation right now that you trust that can write these guidelines? No. I know that Bosco could, but he doesn't have the time. That's right. They've not only got to write the guidelines, but you got to trust them. But they got to be here when you retire, because your time is limited, you know that. And then when you go, what's going to happen? Well, this bill will end up in the underneath Frank Turner of the uh, 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 Committee on, on Roads within your own department, and you know that he will do change, change, change over time, implement what he wants to and implement what he doesn't want to, and it'll be watered down and changed, and you'll never even recognize your bill. So someone has to be here to go on after you're gone. Who do you recommend, Doug? I said, well, the only state in the union that I know has had any experience with highway beautification happens to be the state of Utah. So that who I'm going to recommend is from Utah because of their experience. And that person has to come out of Utah's Department of Highways or Transportation. It's got to come out of that. Does that make sense? He says, it does. Who do you recommend? There's only one person. One person that I have met and know that could step in and be the czar of highway beautification reporting directly to you with Bosco on his side. And that is Jack Francis. Without Jack Francis, I would not be here. And then I told him how I had to remove a bill, seven billboards. When the highway was, was broadened, Parley's Canyon coming down, and uh, that I was told by the state, take my seven signs and just move them back onto the property. And I said no. I could not do that. Because under the Highway Beautification Act, any new sign after a certain date, which this would be, I would never receive just compensation if and when the beautification program is implemented. So I said no. I told him that. I went to the director of highways. He agreed with me, but he wanted to find out what the attorney general thought. And that was Vernon Romney. And so they go over there. Vernon Romney agrees that they're going to have to pay me for my signs. Now, the contractor wanted to tear them down immediately. And I said, if you touch one of those signs, you'll rue the day, Mr. Contractor because I'm never going to touch when those signs will be removed until the state gives me a check for those seven signs. Now, there were other sign companies had moved their signs back. That's them, not me. That's their fault, not my fault. And out of that, they realized that they're going to have to have someone appraise the signs. There's never been any precedent of a sign being appraised in the history of the road system in the United States. And Jack Francis, the lowest guy on the totem pole practically, came and appraised my signs. 
Mr. Secretary. That's who I recommend. He says, is he a Mormon? Now, Volpe, he, he goes to mass every morning before he goes to the, his office. <laughs> He's a devout Catholic. He was born in Italy. And I said, yes, he is a Mormon. And this is what he said. Hell fires, Doug. They're starting to call me a Mormon around here because of my association with you. <laughs> and I said to him, but has my association in any way been negative? He says, no, I've loved it. Do you trust me? Yes. Absolutely, I trust you. Then I told him this. Sir Walpole, the first Prime Minister of England, number one, who was Prime Minister for 22 years, made the statement that all men have their price. Mr. Secretary, I have no price. Jack Francis has no price. One of the most fundamental principles that we operate on as a people is the statement of Joseph Smith, the founder of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. He was asked the question, what is the most important virtue of all? And he answered, loyalty. And if there's no loyalty, there is no honesty. Jack Francis has been raised in that type of an environment. You're not gonna buy him off. And he would be loyal as long as he has the position. We can take him to the bank. Well, can you get him to come and see me? I said, yes. So I call Mr. Helland, head of the department. I wire in Moss, he's on board. I call Jack Francis. Take the next plane to Washington, D.C. And he did. And they hired him. And that's the reason that they're able to remove 900,000 signs from the nation's highways because that man saw that program through. And when that was done, he retired from government. He had a son. Family was lived there for several years, obviously, was building homes. Jack being an appraiser by background, it was a duck soup for him. He built homes, 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 did very, very well, retired, and today he lives in Hawaii. I just can't believe it's happened. I think basically that my statement to him, yes, he is a Mormon, and that's the reason you can trust him, was my statement to Volpe. Yes, he is a Mormon. That's the reason you can trust him. Well, I wanted to just take eight and nine, and then I'm gonna close it right there. This one right here, that bill that they killed, that has written here in the Des Moines Register, 3M losing bid to save billboards. And it says, Minnesota Money and Manufacturing is on the verge of losing a big one here in Washington. They do not like to lose, and they do not lose 
very often. And then it went on to say that in effect, that they influenced greatly the position of the house. And in this article it says, they provide for no snar planned projects. <laughs> in that article in the Des Moines Register. Now, one thing to let you know, and I'm gonna close the story, that here I had worked all this time, and the Senate had written up an amendment to hook to their uh, federal highway bill. But it has to be voted on. I found myself standing there's a little, there's a doorway to go into the Senate floor. And I was standing, and they're coming up to vote on this uh, bill, Federal Highway Bill. But there has to have the amendment attached to it of the Snar Plans Amendment, basically. And what it says here, in this article here, in the Minneapolis Tribune, so well, they were following this very closely because this paper is the paper that uh, affects all this, the Minnesota money and manufacturing employees, particularly in national advertising. By virtue of some last minute hustling, as the bill was about to pass, the Senate Thursday, the ceiling was eliminated. Senators John Sherman Cooper, Republican Kentucky, and Gordon Allett, Republican Colorado, had agreed to offer the amendment, but when the time came, they were nowhere to be found. They weren't on that floor. I was right there. I knew everyone on that floor. I'm, I, I was terrified. Douglas Snar, an anti-3M billboard company owner from Utah, did some hasty phone calling on the Capitol phone, supposedly reserved for Senate staff members only. It's not for the public like me. This is for Senate people only to use that phone. And it was right there on the edge. As you go in, that phone was hanging right there, and I grabbed that phone. Uh, <clears throat> uh, staff members only, and rounded up, talking about me, uh, uh, necessary senators just in time, moths included. The amendment passed without opposition. Now, when I got them on the phone, I said, run, 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 run quickly, and to get over here. Make the phone call if you have to, to delay on this thing until you get there. Then I left there and went up into the uh, uh, gallery. As the voice vote was taken, Snar, sitting in the Senate gallery, shouted, Hooray! A guard threw him out for disrupting the decorum of the Senate. But he said he didn't mind. Well... Frankly, as Emerson wrote, an institution is only eff effective to the degree of the shadow of one man. And I had to be involved in every little dinky aspect. And if I wasn't there, I'd have been defeated. I think we'll close it right there. Thank you.